please join me as we sing together a beautiful hymn, and I think it's one that is very appropriate for the times that we are living in right now. This is a hymn that we've sung for many years in times like these, hymn number 455. Let's stand and sing together. like these you need a savior in times like these you need an anchor be very sure be very sure your anchor holds and grips the He's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like Good evening. It's good to have all of you with us tonight. Uh, all of you coming by way of uh, Facebook and uh, I guess Vimeo and and our website and who know YouTube and all these different things. But uh, glad to have you. I, I'm learning all this stuff. I'm an old dog that has been slow to get new tricks, but uh, learn all these things. And I certainly am grateful for Brother Dwight and for for Harold and their work in helping us to be able to reach so many people. Um, during these past 10 to 11 weeks, uh, you know, we've been driven out of the house of God because of this virus and this pandemic that's going. And yet at the same time, God has used what Satan would use to try to thwart the movement of God. And God has just used it to just explode uh, the people that are coming on. Um, it, it's amazing the numbers. And I uh, just was talking with Dwight the other day and uh, he was sharing with me how many different people we have. And so... I invite you again tonight to join us as we go to the Word of God, and I hope that we have plenty of people today that, that are watching us or this evening that are watching. But tonight, I want to give you a, a, a message that's going to deal with a lot of Scripture, but uh, I believe if you'll hang with me tonight, I believe it'll be the same as it was for me last night as I sat at my home and as I was going through my notes and, and trying to just lay out kind of how I wanted to bring this. 
Um, I wanted to, to share this with you because I think all of us understand and realize that we've all received a calling in our life. And that calling is to share Jesus with other people. As most of you know, uh, the last several Sunday nights, including my own testimony, Brother Mark gave his, and several of our people here uh, ha have shared their testimonies, and it's powerful to be able to say, this is what God has done for me. And uh, as we move forward, I want more of our people to be willing to stand up because I think it's extremely powerful. Actually, Mark and I are working on a situation right now where we're going to try to uh, work and get a testimony from a gentleman who is not actually it's a black gentleman uh, that has a powerful testimony that had dealings with me when I was still a police officer in the middle of my career and I think it will be absolutely powerful for you to see this man after God touched him and changed his life so there there is uh, certainly power in all of our people in sharing uh, the good news of what Christ has done for them and so um, I certainly want to encourage all of our people that if they ever feel led to be able to share what God's done in their life and to be able to proclaim that, then I want to be able to do that. And we'll certainly take those and put them on. And so from time to time, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, we really feel led to do that. But tonight, I'm going to preach. And I want to share with you uh, what the Word of God says. And I want to, I guess if I had to entitle this tonight, it's God's example of sharing His gift with others. And if I ask you a question tonight, what is the gift that God has given to all of us, then it's, it should be very simple for all of us to know that is salvation. That we received an unmerited gift, that God has given us the gift of life. He has given us, give us salvation. We're living in a world right now that is upside down. That is a place that I hardly don't even recognize anymore. And sometimes I thank God, I, I just told Dwight not long ago that, that I'm so glad that I'm not a policeman anymore because uh, things are so rough and hard. And yet I'm reminded that we are the victors today because we have trusted in that free gift that God has given to us. So therefore, if God has granted us the greatest gift that a man or a woman could ever receive, then we must be willing in turn now as born-again believers to share with other people, this is what Jesus did for me. I believe this with all my heart. Now, tonight I am honored to have Bobby Crisco sitting here listening to this message as we tape it. And yet I know this, uh, and I would challenge Bobby, he might know a whole lot more than I even imagine, but Bobby, do you know as many scriptures as I do? And Bobby may say, no. I don't know as many as you do. I know of them, but I don't know them like you do, or, or Pastor Mark, or, or I could call one of your names uh, that are in here tonight. I could call Pam. But you could ask these people, you know, I might not. But one thing that I could tell Bobby as my friend, and I look at Bobby right now, one thing that you have is that unspeakable gift that came into your heart of what Jesus did for you, and the devil cannot take that away from you. And all God wants us to do tonight is to understand that He wants to set an example for us that we're to tell others what He has done for us and how He has redeemed our life. You know, I stand up here tonight and uh, I think about a conversation I just had recently with a, a gentleman that, that none of us have arrived. All of us struggle with sin. All of us have to go to the Father and ask for forgiveness. All of us are trying every day to do the right thing, especially in these days when um, sometimes it just makes uh, the things that we see on the news and on sports channels and everything else just makes your blood kind of boil sometimes. And yet we've got to remember that, Lord, give me a heart of flesh. Give me one that the Spirit of the living God dwells in and fill me with your love and then help me to be willing to share that love. And I certainly can't do a very effective job of that if I allow the bitterness and the wickedness of this world to, to snuff out the light of the gospel. So, Brother Bobby, you know that you always got a testimony. I've heard some people say, well, I don't know what to say. Or, you know, and you ask, well, has God done anything for you? Well, yeah, like that. Well, then be willing to tell somebody. If somebody were to come up to me right now and say, Brother Gary, how do I get saved? And my mind goes completely blank. 
I can't remember Romans 3.23 or, or 6.23. I can't remember Romans 5.8. I can't remember 10.13. I can't remember all those verses. I can't remember 1.18 of, of the book of Isaiah. I've forgotten all that. My mind is just froze. But there's one thing that I do carry within me at all times is I can testify. I could look at Brother Bobby or Mark and I could sit there and say, Well, Brother Mark, it's like this. I know what Jesus did for me. Let me tell you what he did in my life. And I can share with them how I came to the point that I accepted Christ as my Savior. And that's all God wants us to be willing to do is to share what we can. Not everybody is a preacher. Not everybody is a missionary. Not everybody is like a Mark Wilburn or Dwight Ayers who has a, a tremendous amount of knowledge. Or a Roger Pritchard or Charles Allen and we could go down the line of Bonnie Davenport. He's not, not everybody's like that, but you are who you are, and we all have a testimony of what God has done for us. Now, leading people to Christ is our primary responsibility once we become a Christian. And you know what? I'm going to stop right there because the Holy Spirit just told me I need to invoke the power of God on this message tonight. And uh, I need to pray. So would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather in this sanctuary, Lord, whether we're here physically or whether we're just listening, Lord, over the internet. I pray tonight, God, that the power of the Holy Ghost would go out from my voice. Lord, it is not about me. It is not about anything I've studied, but it's about your word. And tonight I ask that you would honor your word. And Lord, you have said that you'd be lifted up that you would draw all men unto you. And so, God, tonight I pray that the power of God would draw people and that, God, you would be honored tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight our primary responsibility as a born-again believer is to share what God has done for us. Now, Jesus is our divine example. Now, we think about that. He is the one. When I think about who do I try to be like, that's who I need to be like. I don't need to be like the very best person that I know. Many of you have heard me speak very many times about a gentleman who was special in my life that was 102 years old, never heard a thing in his mouth ever wrong, and always built me up and strengthened me when I was still at Crossroad. And I had to have a part in his funeral, and, and I did his funeral and laid him to rest, and yet as good a man as he was, that's who I need to be like. That's who I ascribe to be because all of us are sinners in need of a Savior. So Jesus is our example, and he was sent in this world to win the lost. And so we know that that's true. Now, perhaps our greatest human example, if you could think of it that way, was the Apostle Paul. I believe that Paul probably ended up being one of the greatest Christians that ever lived, especially in the New Testament. And I certainly am not shortchanging Peter or any of the others uh, because they gave their life for the cause of Christ. We just studied Wednesday night about Philip and how Philip was crucified upside down, as tradition says, and that as he sat there, they said for two or three days dying, that he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ from that cross. Folks, that's faithfulness to Christ. That is, that is giving everything that you've got to Him. And I think about all those. And certainly, and if you hadn't been joining us on Wednesday night, please do. Because right now we're learning more about the apostles. And learning about those who Jesus kept closest to Him. So our greatest example, I believe humanly, is the Apostle Paul. He, had, he demonstrated how Christians should go after the lost. And I said, yes, we ought to go out of this building... We ought to get out of our homes. We ought to get out of the office and go see those that are lost and tell them about Jesus. Now, Paul talked to everybody he met. And uh, he went from house to house, according to the Scripture. He went day and night, warning them of what the Word of God says. Paul believed that all men and women were lost. And I believe that everybody at the sound of my voice today, at one time in your life, were lost. But God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, spoke to your heart, drew you to a point where you made a decision to accept Jesus Christ. 
And once that decision was made and you became a Christian, that the blood of Christ was, was placed upon your heart, that your name was written in the Lamb's book of life, and that the Spirit of God was left in your heart as a deposit, then our only obligation that I'm really aware of, now there's a lot of things, we, we owe everything to our God. But the only thing He asks is for us to be a light to a, to a dark and lost world, to be willing to tell others about Jesus. So Paul believed that everybody was lost and undone without Christ. He believed that Jesus loved them, died for them, and now he tries his best to win them. And folks, that's where we need to be. So I want you to listen for just a moment about Paul's motivation and, and how it backs up some of the statements I just said. In Acts chapter 20, verses 20 and 21, and it says, And he went from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, I got news for you today that there's hope for anyone out there, even those who are burning buildings, even those who shoot police officers, even for police officers who abuse their power and their authority, there is hope for all those people through Jesus Christ and that we must point them to Him. Then I think about Acts chapter 20, verses 26, and then verse 31. It says, Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure of the blood of all men. Now I want to ask you today, do you feel like you have blood on your hands today? Has someone passed away? Or somebody slipped through your fingers that you know that the Holy Ghost told you, go speak to, and you didn't do it? Something to think about. But Paul said, I am pure of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare, declare unto you the counsel of God. I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Folks, that's Paul. That's the example that we're to look at. He said, every day with tears. He prays and seeks the lost that they might be one to him. Then I think about 1 Corinthians Chapter 2, verse 2, it says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So folks, what it ought to be about us today, it shouldn't be about, I'm a police, former policeman. I was a police chief. All that stuff means nothing. It made to me, it made to my family, it has been good to me. And I was able to do a lot of things. It was a ministry to me. But folks, the only thing that matters today is that Jesus Christ loved me, gave himself for me, died for me, rescued my soul from the pit of hell, and put my feet on the solid rock. And he's done it to every one of you today that are born again, that are true believers. And for that reason, it should always be about him. One of the things, and, and some of you... Uh, I think would agree with this statement that, that I have this fixation with Billy Graham, and I do, because he's a great man of God, probably one of the greatest men of our time, and that he lived what he, he, he apparently lived what he preached, but he made his messages simple, and it was always about Jesus, and it was always about the cross and the blood. And folks, that's how it ought to be in every one of our lives today. It always, I, I had a preacher tell me one time, he said, always remember this, Gary. He said, as long as you preach about Jesus Christ, as long as you preach about that cross, and as long as you preach the blood of Jesus, you'll never, ever go wrong. Now you can preach about things that you want to. I can uh, preach a message to try to get back at somebody or this or that or or, or, and all of you know what I'm talking about, and that's of the flesh. But when you're talking about Him, and Him being lifted up and magnified, that's what I'm saying. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 9, 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 9, I know I'm moving fairly quickly, but please get these references for us, but uh, it says, I have planted... And Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. 
Now, I want you to understand what that means. I have been willing to go to somebody and share the gospel with them, point them to Jesus Christ. And then Mark comes along and go visits the same person, and he waters that seed that has already been placed in their heart. Let me give you an example. Just a few weeks ago, Mark and I both have a mutual friend. And he probably knows him even better than I do, and we both know him well. And as the Lord would have it, he went first, and he sowed the seed of the gospel in this man's life. He shared with him, he's very sick, he's not doing well, and we just don't know if he's ready to go. And he shared the gospel seed, he planted that air in his heart. Then just a day later, God sends me to his place. And I'm like Apollos here, I've watered that seed. I cried out to him, I pointed him to Jesus, and I told him, and I, as Mark and I say sometimes, and many of you will know what we're talking about, I came flat-footed with him. And I said, buddy, I said, if you don't make sure that you know that you know, you're going to bust hell wide open. you got to know, because I asked him, and he couldn't tell me if he's saved. So I watered that seed, and I left, knowing that he had never committed while I was there. Now, can he after I leave? Yes. And the quietness of his home, he could do it. But I'm praying that God will give us the harvest, whether it be him, whether it be me, or somebody else is sent to this man, that he will finally say, you know what? I submit unto his authority. And Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and life. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. So folks, that's what Paul is saying here. I planted, Apollo, Apollo watered, but God gave the increase. For we are laborers together with God. That means whether it's Mark Wilburn or Bobby Crisco or Dwight Ayers or Charles Allen or Joanna Mason or Pam or Gary Gray, whoever it may be in here today, that all of us are joint laborers with God. And ultimately, all we're asked to do is to be willing to go. And He does the work. Amen? Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, it says, To the weak became I as weak. Now listen to what Paul is saying. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now we know that Paul can't save anybody. He couldn't. I can't save anybody, but I can get myself into the place, and we can go in ministry. One of the great things that, that I pointed out about Pastor Mark is Mark has a people that have been down on their luck. He has a passion to reach out to those, and a lot of it has to do with where he came from, from the raising that we had. He has a heart for people that a lot of people would reject and just say, I ain't got time for you. You're... You, you don't look like I do, or you didn't come from where I did, or you didn't have this kind of job. And so we all have a part, just like Paul is saying here, that I might by all means save some. In other words, bring them to the master. And so that's where we need to be on that. So I hope that you understand that that's kind of where Paul was at, that he was about leading others to Christ. Now Paul set the example for each of us in sharing that faith that, that, that he is to have, that we're to have. And, and unto those that are lost. And I'm reminded of a verse that we had a couple of weeks ago. It said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and to us, the Greek. That's what that stands for. Aren't you glad today that God made His salvation available to all of us? And I'm thankful for that today. And, uh, and so, Paul was a chosen vessel to bring the glory of God and the good news of Christ to a lost world. And he was told that he would suffer greatly for... You think about Paul's life. He drug off Christians. He had them tortured and beaten. Some were killed. He sat there and, and consented to the stoning of Stephen when they killed that young man who was full of the Holy Ghost. And Paul was there. He was named Saul then. But God, 
And it makes you think now with all this wickedness that's going on in this world. And to see a man who, who on a vision that I'll never stop hearing in my mind is this man who was beaten to death in front of a store. He's laying there in some kind of position where he's almost locked. And the guy, it wasn't enough that they had killed him, that this one guy came back and took his wallet and took off running. And my blood as a policeman boiled. And yet when I study the Word of God, I'm reminded that the Apostle Paul was the same type of man that did that. And except for the grace of God, it could be me that was out there on those streets riding and doing something horrible. And yet God came after me. He had a plan for Paul's life. He went after him. He stopped him on that road that day, struck him blind, got his attention, got him in the path, and then he said, all right, Paul, here's the deal. Saul, now Paul, he said, you'll suffer greatly for the kingdom. And he did. And I want to go through what the scripture says that he faced during his life. Uh, he was a chosen vessel. And I want you to understand, God loved him immensely, and despite of who he was, despite of the wickedness that he was involved in, God saw him for what he could be. And so I want us to understand today that even with those images that we see constantly, take away black and white. It is about human beings that God loves beyond what we can even conceive and comprehend. And that God has a plan for each one of them. The Bible tells us over in the book of Corinthians that right now people's minds are blinded by Satan. And that Satan has them blind to what they're doing. Their heart is hard. They don't know Christ. You can't act and, and, and do that way and know Jesus. And it brings credence to the fact that this world, this country, is filled with many lost people. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, anymore if I hear that America is a Christian nation, I do not believe that. I believe America is a nation that has got Christians in it. But I do not believe that we're a Christian nation. Because there's so many that are apart from him. And yet I'm reminded of this. That when Jesus died on that cross, he died for each one of them. Black or white, brown, far east, white. It don't matter. He died for all of us. And that he desires for all of us to know him. Now listen to what Paul faced for the cause of Christ that is laid out throughout the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 9, that'll be the first place we go. And I'm going to point out about nine different things about it. And this is not all conclusive. I just read just recently about where it said that he was standing there trying to give an account for himself and said that the centurion busted his face, busted him right in the mouth. There's no doubt the bruises and the beatings and the pain that Paul endured. But I want you to go with me. In Acts 9, 23, there was a plot from the very beginning to murder Paul. The Word of God says, And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. That means that there was malice aforethought. When I was a detective and if there was a murder and that we were investigating that murder when I was a police officer and we were working and somebody killed somebody and they laid in wait and ambushed and plotted and planned, that's first degree murder. And that's what they were thinking in their heart. We want to take this man out. So from the very beginning, Paul's life was in jeopardy. Secondly, in Acts 9.29, there was a plot again to murder Paul. The scripture verse says, And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. All right, my eyes now have jumped. First of all, let me go back. Acts 9.23. After many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Now, I correct myself now. That's Acts 9.23. The Jews wanted to kill him. They plotted to kill him. Now, in Acts 9.29, the Grecians plotted to have him murdered so folks i want you to understand the threat on his life every day i heard a man 
this morning a football player. He said, there's not a day that I don't ride down the road that I worry that a policeman's going to stop me and beat me or kill me. And it's a shame that it has to be that way and to think that mindset. But I want you to understand that no doubt had to be on Paul's mind every day that I know that people are after me. And yet, it was all about Jesus. Thirdly, today in Acts chapter 13, verse 50, they used lies uh, to, to kick him out of their country and where they were at here. They were, they were coming up with all kinds of lies. It says, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city, and they raised persecution against Paul and his buddy Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. So there was lies and deceit. Does that not mean that, that uh, as a Christian, if you lift up the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ, the people are not going to like it? Have you ever noticed that if you want to get people upset, that all you have to do is just start mentioning the name of Jesus? And they don't like it. I remember my time on the school board. A lot of people didn't like it. They didn't like to have the name of Jesus mentioned. They didn't like to have his name mentioned in prayer. Not necessarily the school folks, it's people that we dealt with. I remember there was obstinance to prayer and to doing things at football games and stuff. That you were all right as you said, well God we thank you today for this day. They would allow you to say that. But Lord I ask you right now in the name of Jesus. There's something about that name. And folks I want you to understand that that's how it was in Paul's life. Fourthly today in Acts 14, 19, Paul here was stoned in Galatia. Now, he consented to the stoning of Stephen, and now he's on the receiving end. And it says, And there came thereafter certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, having stoned Paul. Now, folks, I want you to imagine what that must have been like. To feel rocks coming against your head and your body, bashing and cutting and tearing your skin. And they drew him out of the city, supposing that he was dead, but he wasn't. So Paul was stoned for the gospel, for standing for this man. Again, living out what Christ told him, you will suffer much for the kingdom's sake. Then I think about the fifth thing today in Acts chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, thumb quickly over to there. But this is where he was beaten, and then they cast him into prison. In Acts 16, 22 and 23, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them. Just imagine what that must have been like. They cast them into prison and charging the jailer to keep them safely. So here we see not only has he been stoned, now has he been beaten, uh, beaten to pieces. He's now thrown into a dark, dreary, rat-infested, no doubt, dungeon of a jail. But God was with him. Then I think about 1 Corinthians. We'll move out of Acts for just a minute in 123. Where it's, he was considered and regarded because of his stance for Christ as a fool. It says in this verse in 123, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. So the Greeks actually, people like we are, they seen him as a fool. I can't believe he's preaching something like this. And of course the Jews didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah. And so we see here where he received that ridicule. Seventhly today, in the book of Acts, It'll be at chapter 17, and we're going to go to verse 10. Um, he's referred to, and all of you know this, about when they, all this group of uh, kind of like a right crowd, a righteous crowd, they went to the house of Jason. Now, I want you to understand, Jason was allowing Paul and his sidekick to stay there. They were allowing them to have safety in his home, no doubt, food and rest. And this mob came to Jason's house. And this statement ought to ring out for all of us. 
In 1710 it says, And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night into Berea. In other words, they slipped them out the back door of the house. Who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So they were, they were turned away. But the thing that I want you to understand is that when they come out there, they were looking for Paul and Silas, and they made that one statement, those who have turned our world upside down. I wonder today, are we as a church, Balfour, I'm talking to you tonight as you listen to me, and those of you that are born again, you know, that go to other churches, we'd love for people to come here. But are we turning as a family of God, are we turning this world upside down? And I'm afraid many times, the only hope that this world has right now is that the power of God be poured out on this land. And guess how it will be poured out? Through God's people. Folks, it is time for the church of the living God to come alive, to come awake, and to not be ashamed, not to shrink back, but to be willing in the name of Jesus to stand for what we believe is right and to do it in a spirit of love. Not about, it's not about racial stuff. People make it racial. It's not about a bad policeman. It's not about people that make mistakes. It's about calling what is right and what is wrong and knowing that the only hope for this country is Jesus. It's only Jesus. And only He can change this. So I think about that. You know, I, I would to God that people could refer to Balfour Baptist Church, wouldn't it be something to have some people, that bunch up there at Balfour who have turned this world upside down? That group, Mark, that, that says unto you that has turned Ashboro upside down for the kingdom. And folks, I just don't think we're there yet. And we need to get there. So folks, I'm talking now as a family of God. Forget about Balfour Baptist Church. It's all of us who have been born again. Are we turning our world upside down for the kingdom? Can people see our life, listen to us talk, and how we act, and tell that we're born again? And I'll just challenge you with that. In Acts 17, verse 13. Acts chapter 17, verse 13. But the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea. And they came thither also and stirred up the people. All right, again... This mob mentality that we're facing all across our country. It says they stirred up the people and immediately the brethren had to send Paul away to go as if it were to see. So Paul, for it, it wasn't his time. It wasn't time for Paul to leave this world. So the brethren had to get him out of there. Now, the ninth thing, Acts 17.32. Paul is laughed to scorn in Athens, Greece. As he preaches the gospel. I ask you today. Is everybody going to be a willing recipient of what you have to say? No. There will be some people that will say, I don't want to hear what you got to say. You need to get off my property. You need to leave me. I don't want to hear that mess. I don't believe in it. Had a guy just not long ago told me, he said, I don't believe that book. There's certain things in there I might believe. But I don't believe it. And my heart broke for him because I knew that if he don't believe this book, then he's got problems. And the end result is not going to be good. And so, folks, I, I think about how Paul was there. Listen to what this verse says in 32. It says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, We will hear thee again on this matter. Some was interested. But others made fun of it and laughed at it and put it to scorn. Folks, if I sit here and tell you today that Jesus is coming soon, there's going to be some that will laugh at that. They would laugh me to scorn. There's going to be some that you really believe that the dead's going to come out of the ground and that you're going to be called out of here? And my answer is, yes, I do. Because the Word of God tells me it's going to. And Paul believed it and preached it. Folks, I believe that as sure as I stand here today and as sure as I preach the gospel message, I believe that, that this day God could say, you know what, it's enough. I'm calling my children home. 
And you could go over there and hear the sound of the voice of the archangel as he's commanded by Jesus to bring my children home. And I believe that you'll hear the trumpets of God sound as we're called out of this world to go home. And yes, I believe we'll hear it. I believe that we'll hear those trumpets. Do I believe that the world will hear all that? Nope. But I think we will. I certainly am not an expert on any of this. But I believe the Word of God, and I believe it's coming, and I believe it could be today. I believe it could be tomorrow. I, could, I believe it could be next week or next month. And if God so chooses next year or the next decade. And you might say, well, why does God hold off with all this falling apart in the world? Why does He wait? So that one more might know Him and not bust hell wide open. Even those who are blinded by the enemy. So folks, keep that in mind, and I certainly am trying to. So he was laughed to scorn, and so will you be. And then I think about over in Acts 21. We look over there, if you would, slow down just a little bit. I've talked so hard and so fast, I just about got cramps in my stomach here. But uh, Acts chapter 21, and we'll look at 27 through 33. Beginning with verse 27, Paul was beaten and chained by soldiers. That is the whole thing that we want to look at. Then 27, and when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the temple. And they laid hands on him. And I can assure you that they was probably knees on his neck and back and everything else too. And crying out, Men of Israel, help. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into this temple and hath polluted his holy place. For they had seen before him in the city of Trophimus an Ephesian, and, and who supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul, and they drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions, and they ran down unto them, and when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. And then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And I'll stop reading for right there. But again, we see this man of God who at one time prided his life on thinking he was a religious man and how he led Christians off captive and he had them beat. And when Christ seized him on that road, he said, Saul, I have a plan for your life. But I want you to understand this, that much will you suffer for my name. So folks, should we think any less about our lives? What little suffering we do, that if we stand for the cause of Christ, and I promise you, someday it's going to cost all of us to stand for what we believe in. I had a guy call me a while ago and ask me, he said, do I change my stand on the Word of God? He said, do I lighten up my load in order to keep my relationships with my children? And certainly I'm not going into any of that and not calling the person. But folks, here's the deal. It's going to cost you something to stand for the truth. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to stay the course until the end? Here's an example of a man who was beaten and chained by these soldiers because he stood for what he believed in. And folks, that's the challenge for all of us. Then 11, Acts 23, 12. Acts chapter 23, verse 12. And it's, it says, And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. So again, he starts off his ministry under the threat of death. He is stoned. 
He is beaten. He is spit at. He is mocked. He is ridiculed. He's imprisoned. He's chained. No doubt, no telling what all happened to him. All for the cause of carrying his name. Now do you see, he earned some pretty good points, didn't he, in his walk with Christ. And I believe the Word of God tells us that this example is what we ought to be willing to do also. Now, in Acts 25, 7, he was falsely accused. If I was sitting here tonight and I say, Pam, have you ever been falsely accused of anything? And most of us will say, yes, I have. Somebody's accused me of something I didn't do or I didn't say. Well, here we have the same thing with Paul. They made up lies on him. In Acts 25, 7, it says, And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. They lied on him. Where does the lies come from? Satan. What does the Bible say? I believe it's 844. That Satan is the father of lies. And he's been a liar from the very beginning. And so here we see Satan at work trying to snuff out one of God's men. And he'll be at work in the sanctuary. He'll be at work in every one of our lives today. Trying to bring accusations against us. Lies that are not right. And how do you handle that? You just got to stay faithful and just cry out to God. I told this gentleman today that, that, that talk with me, and I say it to you. What do you do when you don't know where to turn? When things are being said that are not right? When things are being accused of you and you don't know what to do and you don't know how to recount them? Folks, sometimes you just got to say, God, I don't know what to do. But my eyes are on you. Lord, I trust you. God, help me. And I believe God will help us. And I believe God will see us through whatever we face in our life we're just about through here the 13th thing that I want to share with you is this is that not only was he beaten not only was he stoned not only was he punched in the face not only was he lied about not only did they slander him not only did they plot to kill him on numerous occasions not only was he sent away but he also endured a shipwreck now I want you to go to Acts 27, and we'll read about this, and as I said, we're, we're coming to a close in our message for tonight. I know it's a lot of information, but uh, I don't know about you, but I think this is extremely interesting to hear about this man that we refer to oftentimes, but we forget what all he did do. In Acts 27, beginning with verse 41, and falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart struck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them for their purpose, and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest some on boards, some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safely to land. It was still not God's time for him to leave. And he saw him through a shipwreck. So it's absolutely, in my opinion tonight, it's absolutely amazing of all that Paul experienced in his life and all that he lived through. I've often wondered, wonder what Paul looked like with all the scars and wounds that he had received over his time and yet all that was for the price of serving him and don't you know that God has honored him today all for the glory of God and all that folks like you and I might be born again today aren't you glad that Paul went to the Gentiles Aren't you glad today that God said for Paul to go to them? The Jews won't accept me, so we'll take it to the Gentiles. And aren't you glad? Because today, you have the hope of heaven. Just a few minutes ago, I was in my office and I was reading about eternity. 
And my mind just went to another place of all that God has prepared for all of us today. And it's all because of the blood. And it's all because of the sacrifice of so many who believed in what we believe in right now, except they gave their life for it. I think about all the martyrs of Christ. I think about many of the disciples that followed him gave their all for the cause of Christ. Folks, may we never forget. May we always look to their example. May we remember what somebody like Paul did for our life. It's absolutely, as I said earlier, amazing to think about what he did. But folks, I pray that while all of us still have breath in our lives, and we, folks, the bottom line is we have been blessed. I talked to a friend of mine this morning, and you'll remember it well. And we talked about how blessed we are. That many of us that were sitting at a table this morning drinking coffee are all basically retired. I retired from law enforcement, now I work full time here. But all of us were talking about how we're blessed and how God's been good to us. Number one, He saved us. He's wrote our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. There ain't nothing the devil can do to take that name out of that book. Nothing. Bobby, there ain't nothing can take you away from Him. Dwight Ayers, there ain't nothing can separate you from the love of God. And so that's what we got to hang on to today. And we think about how God provides food for us to eat and have friendship to be together, to have a church to come to. He has blessed us with children and grandchildren. And yes, there's hard times and there's hard things to deal with, but God has blessed us and been good to us. Folks, I'm just reminding you that there may come a time if we live another 10, 15, 20 years where it's going to cost you something for what you believe. Will you be up to the task? I pray today that, number one, we will look to Jesus and be reminded that He is my ultimate one that I look at. He is who I want to be like. But may we also look in the Scripture and find people like the Apostle Paul who fleshed out their faith and was willing to go. And great will be His reward. I challenge you today to remember what you've been called to. I challenge you today, for anyone that's listening today, that you'll remember that you've been saved with a precious price, that your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life and the devil don't like it. And I can promise you that he will attack you, he will come after you, and he will do everything he can to discourage you. But just know this, he can't touch you. God will not allow him to take your name out of his book. So you've got to trust him. We may get sick, we may experience hardship, we may be like Job. What if God were to say, have you considered my servant Pam? Or have you considered Joanna? Have you considered Mark? Have you considered Joey? And I could go through the whole list of names that are here. What if he said, my hedge about them is taken down, but you can't have them? Folks, may we be strong in the Lord. May we be willing to, to understand what we're called to do. And may you be encouraged as a Christian today. I know this is not a light message. And I know the image of, of, of blood and beating and, and all that this man experienced. But I challenge you today. Look to Jesus. Trust Him. Cry out to Him. And be filled with the Spirit of God. And folks, may our people be filled with love. May God help us to love others. May God help me to have a right heart. And may God give me a desire to see that all men and all women might be saved. Will you join me with a word of prayer? Father, I thank you so much for this day and for this privilege that we've had on this Sunday. I thank you for the message that Pastor Mark brought to our graduates uh, this morning. And Lord, I pray that God, that you would use that to encourage and stir them. And even in our hearts, as, we, as the same thing applies in all of our lives. That God, you do have a plan for our life. And then Lord, tonight as we come together, and Lord, I don't know how well I've done it, but I know it's a lot of scripture. But God, I pray tonight that as we see the vision of Paul, and we see what you did through his life, all that he suffered, all that he did for the glory of God. Lord, help us too to be faithful. 
Help us to be willing to tell others while we have a blessed hope. And God, I pray that our people, that if they get asked, to, would you be willing to testify? I pray that they'll say, I'd be honored to do that. So God, I ask you to move and work in a mighty way. Be lifted up. Touch hearts and lives, Lord, tonight. And God, I thank you for this privilege I've had to bring the word. Bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just wanted to say thank you today for watching our service, our broadcast. I've done the best that I can today to preach the Word of God and to be able to share with you in a powerful way. And I just wanted to make sure that you understand that if you have any type of need that we can help you, any prayer concern that we can do, please contact us and let us know because we want to be a blessing to you. It's about the kingdom of heaven and it's about you and it's about being able to meet your needs. And so we just want to thank you today for choosing to come on our broadcast and to listen to what we have to say. And I just pray that God's been blessed and lifted up and honored. Uh, if you have a desire today to give to our ministry, and I can assure you that every dime that we ever receive will go to the full gospel ministry of getting the Word of God out to other people. So just hit the giving tab that's there on our web page and, uh, and all that will just kind of guide you through it. So I just want you to know today that we're grateful to have you. And this is a tremendous part of our ministry right now that is going on with the internet and people coming to our website. We're excited about what God's doing. We're excited about what He's going to uh, do through this effort here. And so anyway, I just want you to know that we want to be a blessing to you. Please join us again. And we look forward to that.